Hello, everybody. It's Heather with the Leadership Heart Podcast. And today I am thrilled to be talking to Jonathan Barnett. And I got, you know, I get a lot of folks for some reason lately, they've been uh, pitching me on different guests and I'd say no a whole, whole bunch, but occasionally I'll see a description of a CEO or of a leader and, and the work that that person does and go, Ooh, that would be an interesting twist, something different for the listeners. And in this case, that's, that was the case with Jonathan and really was kind of a focus on sustainability and just actually more, when we think of leadership at heart, it was more of a global um, view and a much broader view in the world of what this looks like. So anyway, welcome, Jonathan. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you being, being on the show. So where are you right now in your leadership journey? Tell, tell the listeners. Yeah, um, it's, it's been quite the journey for sure. Um, so when I, when I started Oxy Fresh in 2006, I was just finished grad school and I was actually uh, cleaning carpet um, because I was unsuccessful in fundraising for a nonprofit that I started um, where we take basketball players overseas and work with youth to do camps <clears throat> and uh, play games at night and, and share our story and just make a positive impact. And I was, I was doing, I did that till 2013, but from 2003 till 2006, I was trying to fundraise doing that. And, and it was uh, people thought I just wanted to keep playing basketball because I, I played in college and um, but uh, I really just had a heart to make, be part of something making a difference. So carpet cleaning was, um, but I ended up uh, focusing on carpet cleaning and then uh, scaling it. And so in the beginning, um, when I started Oxfresh, I had about $10,000 of student loan money that I started with. So um, all my employees, I had to keep, uh, you know, my cost for variable. So they only got paid when we got paid uh, more commission-based models. And um, why that's important to, to answer your question is from the beginning, um, running a nonprofit as well as in the beginning with OxyFresh, I definitely had to have... Um, some uh, a good culture and uh, people wanting to be part of something and it wasn't just about the money but leadership had to be uh something that drove our company and um so i think our why of, of why we were doing it was important it was to help fund the nonprofit, um, but also with franchising um it allows franchisees to own a business to help them achieve their dreams and goals and so um you know <clears throat> i never dreamed about being a car cleaner my whole life but I did dream about following my dreams and passions and over years that has changed. And so now it's my family. We have six, my wife and I have six kids and um, it's my passions about helping other franchisees in our system achieve their dreams and goals. So um, our philosophy here uh, at OxyFresh is uh, upside down servant leadership. So we have, we believe instead of everyone below us serving us that we need, like I serve my management staff, my management serves the franchisees and the franchisees serve the customers. So it's an upside down pyramid and we promote from within here at our, at our office. So like my VP started off in the call center. So did my call center manager. So did my, um, my, uh, but most of my management staff has been promoted from within. So we do that when we can, and that really creates a uh, culture and we don't really have a lot of turnover. Um, but we believe in what we're doing and, and we, and our why is, is uh, very important to us. I love that. Uh, gosh, I mean, I would never have thought just that with your view and your progressiveness being in the carpet cleaning company. And I saw a connection between there was something about water.org mm -hmm. and clean water. Can you talk a little bit more about that? That was super interesting to me. Yes. So um, that kind of goes back to uh, another thing I, I learned in college. My first business was a fireworks stand and um, I did that in the summertime and I called it college fund fireworks. And a couple of my college buddies did it with me and it helped us Pay, pay some stuff, some college bills. And, and, um, and so that was, uh, I learned, you know, they say cause marketing is a thing, but also it was a, with a purpose. It was to help some of my college friends and I get through college and with water.org, Oxyfresh, if those that don't know, we're a carpet cleaning business and we use two to four gallons of water to clean a whole house versus our competition uses 40 to 50. So we're big in saving water for the planet, which is great, but to take it a step further, we want to, we want to be part of, uh, helping people that don't have clean drinking water around the world get that. And so with water.org, um, a percentage of all of our online jobs um, go to uh, water.org, which is an amazing organization, and they help build water wells for, um, that provide clean drinking water for those that don't have it. And <clears throat> so we're really, we really love being part of water.org. And, and seeing the stories of how things have been affected. And, and I think our franchisees love that. And um, I think our customers love it too. So 
um, for those out there that don't have a give back, um, I think that um, find something that relates to your current business and and give back because the it'll come back to you. But it'll also, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, it's it makes the culture and it the why is important. That'll that'll last a lot longer than than dollars. <clears throat> mm, yeah, that whole legacy um, that we leave when we look outside ourselves and figure out how the impact we have in our little world can impact the bigger, larger world in a positive way. I think it's, it just seems like it's very powerful to do. Yeah, absolutely. So do you, um, how many are in your corporate team? How many? Mm-hmm. Well, it's kind of an question because we have about 50 people here at the home office. We call it home office instead of corporate office because it's, um, you know, it just, it's just what we do, but um, a majority of those are the scheduling center. So the scheduling center, um, we answer the phone for all the franchisees across the country. And we do that so that they can focus on their business instead of being stuck in their business, focus on getting that phone to ring. So we handle all that inbound calls. And um, so that takes a majority, but I'd say we have about 12 to 14 management, you know, whether it's marketing ops, um, um, code, code writers, or, you know, all franchise dev, like all that is our management staff, but majority of our home office is, is our scheduling center. And we call the scheduling center the heart of our business because without that, without, um, no one else has a job here. If we don't answer the phone and do a good job. So. Mm. That's awesome. Oh, I appreciate that. And I think, uh, that level of support for franchisees is not one you find often, uh, in the, and just wanting to be, make, make sure they're successful so they don't have to be stuck in just like the day-to-day stuff with that. They're just able to go do the work and, and meet the customer's needs. That's awesome. And it also helps us create a consistent experience um, when the, we answer the phone as well as collect, collect data of where the jobs are coming from. So we know what's working to help coach new franchisees, but also more importantly, what's not working. So you know, we're big on tracking ROIs. We're not huge on what I'd say branding. We're, we're big on with technology nowadays, you can track ROIs, um, especially digitally now more than more than ever, if you know, if you know how to do it. So that's really important for us to give that feedback to our franchisees with in a, in a simple way where they can understand it and make decisions. Mm, I love that. Yeah. Simplicity is key. I think if we think about anybody who's entering in and wants to have their own business and have their first, they buy their first, whatever it's, I don't know if it's based on location. Is it based on location? Like market? Um, um, the, our, our territories. Yes. So yeah, we have about 450 or 60 territories across the country and our territories are, are not by land mass, but they're more in population. So it's about 300,000 people or 110,000 homes. Mm-hmm. So they're actually pretty large territories, um, but they're, they're protected. They're not exclusive, but they're protected. So you can't market um, in other people's territories, but um, that, that, that's a great thing for our culture too. We're talking about leadership and culture. Um, I think that franchisees in our system, they love to share what's working because they know that we're truly all in this together and they're not competing against their neighboring franchisee in the same city. Oh yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So I'm curious to know, where does your drive to lead come from? Like, what was it? I, I know that there was a little bit that was happening in college, but just like, was, was there something in like maybe from your past that kind of made you become, you know, an entrepreneur? Yeah. Um, you know, my grandpa was not always an entrepreneur and I always thought it would, I wanted to, uh, he was in, invented stuff with magnets or this or that. Always doing something. So I thought that was super cool. And I remember his first, my first hair, one of my first haircuts when I was little, I've heard stories that uh, I wanted a haircut just like my grandpa, which is bald in the back. So I'm sure he had a lot to do with it at the same time as um, I was a point guard in high school and in college. And so uh, being a point guard, you know, you have to learn servant leadership and leading by example. And um, if you go down the court and, and, and shoot the shots without passing your teammates the ball, they're not going to, they're not going to play defense hard. They're not going to, they're not going to their attitudes aren't going to be right. So you have to be sensitive to all your players and, and know who to, should get the ball in which type of scenario. So I think uh, playing basketball, and, and that's why I say sports um, is a, is a huge um, shaped me in a lot of ways. Um, it told me how not taught me how not to quit, how to be competitive, teamwork, leadership, a lot of things you can learn from sports. And um, so if you look at our management team, a lot of, you know, one, one of our my management team played with me at Oral Roberts in college. Another one, a couple other ones played uh, college as well. And so we have a lot of uh, a- athletics is a is a, a culture of our now we're old now and we're not in shape, but 
but um, it's still, it's still, we, we, uh, we like sports here. That's awesome. Yeah, I agree with you, actually. Um, I didn't do a whole bunch of it when I was younger, but my kids all are. And I do see the the bonds that are created, the respect that's created, just all the different values that are created. Um, what would the people that you lead now say about you? And actually, is there a difference between, did any of those people who were with you in 2006 stay? And what would they say that was different in your leadership back then and what it is now? Yeah, so uh, actually, Rob White, um, he was uh, in 2006, he was a carpet cleaning technician and a call center rep in the beginning because he had to do both jobs because there wasn't enough um, work for just one of the jobs. But he he did that so that he could play with the crossover, the nonprofit that I was telling you about that went overseas. And so he, he 2006, that's what he did. And now he's the director of cleaning systems. But then he's moved on to our onboarding specialist. So he's been with me now since the very, very beginning. Um, and and um other ones have been there been here over 10 years there's people have been here over 10 12 years um but you know every, every year i would just say um 2006 when we started there was if you needed a carpet cleaner or a plumber back then what did you do you looked in the yellow pages right and now we've been through a lot of change with technology and marketing and i mean we're on a podcast now that didn't exist back then but um, we've had to be a, learn to be a company that embraces change and focus on philosophies like leadership or like letting go to grow, um, speed through systems, ownership through scoring. Some of these philosophies that as things change over time, whether it's how yellow pages to Google to paper click to whatever it might be, social media, um, that, that we are a company that embraces change and and so when, once we uh, realize that we're that, then, then um, every day we're like, we just try to solve problems. So. And is that, do you know, do you think that you're, do you think that in this last many years that you have changed how you show up as a leader a lot more? And, and if so, like what contributed to that? I'm curious. Yeah, I think um, I definitely have grown in a lot of ways, um, but I've also feel like my team has helped me grow because uh, to be honest, um, since I've, uh, my wife and I, we've had four kids in the last five years, so we're done having them right now, but, um, they've had to step up a lot because, um, fam family's, uh, family's, um, most important for me. And I hope it is for everyone else out there. I know that everyone needs to work hard, but that's my why right now is my family. So, um, yeah, they've had to step up, but I think that's good for them because they, they deserve to be able to step up. And so, um, yeah, so it's it's fun to watch everyone grow and evolve, and I, we don't like to put boxes around people here. We, we you know people can can work as hard or grow as as much as they want to grow, and and that doesn't. Uh, I love hiring people that are smarter than me, so it makes my job a lot easier. Oh, that, that's awesome. So I am, right now, um, what I want you to do is just I want you to when people hear all the stuff you talked about, they're like, "Gosh, that's a great guy!" Like I love his focus. Like boy, he has a lot of heart. But there was always that time, at least once in most of our um, journeys as leaders, where we didn't show up with that much heart, where maybe we weren't very proud of how we were leading in that moment. Can you share for the listeners a specific story when you were not a leader with heart? You didn't you didn't really demonstrate caring leadership, maybe. And what did you do to come out of it? What was the awakening? What did you do to come out of it? Um, I think in the beginning, um, when I was leading, um, I tried to micromanage and do everything myself and you know i wanted it to be done right and so i think over time i had to learn that it doesn't have to be done right and it's okay to let people fail but if they fail forward and they learn from it and you create an um, environment for them to to learn and grow and so i think in the beginning when i would try to do everything myself i would look very stressed out a lot more than i do now not say i don't sometimes now but um now i have to just let go and i mean with 40 some 30 something 38 call center reps and the phone's ringing from 6 a.m to 7 p.m inbound with the average sec, average hold time of under 30 seconds i mean mondays are busier than than wednesdays wednesdays are busier than saturday so to to manage all that uh with the right amount of staff i've had to let go and let um our scheduling center manager who's been here a very long time do that and she does a better job than me so i would say my biggest change in the over time is learning to let go to grow and create lanes of specialization for your team to grow in and take ownership of. 
Oh, I love that. Let go to grow. That'll be probably in the title of the podcast. <laughs> Leaders with heart, let go to grow. I absolutely love it. Uh, so I am right now we're at the point of the podcast where you get to turn the tables and kind of become a host and ask me any question you have. What question might you have of me knowing the work I do in leadership, employee experience and loyalty? Yeah, um, I just think it's fascinating that you get to interview all these different amazing leaders and get to hear their story. And I'm sure, I mean, I feel like you learn, nothing's a failure if you learn from it. So um, I, I would say, um, when you're interviewing these people on their different forms of leadership, do you find that um, there's different styles or do you find something in common that that uh, seems to be the common thread that makes them good leaders? Uh, great question. I would say both, actually. Um, but I think there are definitely different styles. What I One thing I found is there's definitely not a cookie cutter approach. Different people show up completely. There's some that are full on like outgoing and just like full on people person. And there's those who kind of are like engineers and it's just different types of personalities and they and they, how they show up is different. But in the end, they still can lead with caring leadership, with leaders, leadership at heart. And so what happened is like I, I got to that episode 25 and realized that I needed to codify what I was learning because I was seeing themes and they were powerful. And I knew that most people, when they think of care or like caring leadership, it's very nebulous. So I wanted to create more concrete framework for them. So in that book, I actually boiled it down to nine different behaviors that make up what caring leadership is. And by the way, it's not all squishy, touchy, feely stuff. There's a quite a bit of that. That's the stuff that leaves people feeling good about the work they do for them. But there's other things like setting clear expectations and holding people accountable. There's all kinds of things that still equal caring leadership that I saw in my discussions with people. So it has been amazing. It's been a big privilege of mine to interview so many. I mean, I am telling you every industry you can think of, every walk, every position in the company, it just, um, it different franchises, not all franchises. I mean, manufacturing, it has been amazing. And to be able to say, let's consolidate, let's synthesize what the, the main things are and, and give it to other people around the world has been really helpful. So yeah, I do. I feel, feel blessed to have it. And I've learned a lot. I'm just going to say that for sure. A lot, a lot. Yeah, I I like to say uh, when you take one, something from one person, it's plagiarism, but you take a little bit from everyone, it's research. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I do a lot of research. I'm a qualitative researcher. So pretty much all my work is uh, even there's some quantitative elements on surveys. We do a lot of listening sessions and focus groups and culture team facilitations and employee resource group. So we do all of that at Employee Fanatics. And so we, the, the entire like 80 percent of the work we do is qualitative. So it is listening, 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 consolidating, synthesizing, synthesizing and helping to take all those insights and give it to the leaders of the organizations that can change experience for customers, employees, and everybody alike. Um, so I, yeah, like feel really blessed to do that work. So thank you for asking awesome. that. I okay. So, so. For, yeah. So for those who are listening right now, and they, they, they may not be in the franchise world, they may or may not, but they are just kind of wanting to be a better leader. They want to be a stronger leader. They want to uplift people more and really learn to lead the heart better. What might be a, a pearl of wisdom or two you might leave them with today? Yeah, um, I, I would say that, um, you know, servant leadership doesn't get enough, um, you know, I don't know if the right words credit or enough emphasis in, in the workplace these days. But in our in our um, office, we really try to um, to uh, emphasize servant leadership. And one of the ways we do this is we have our value statements um, kind of posted up on the walls in our office. And so everyone has to see them all the time as well as some of our, of our philosophies. Um, so our value statement, um, and you know, anyone can, you gotta have to create what it is for your own company. But I think um, in the beginning, I didn't realize how important a value statement was, but it's important that everyone is on the same page with your values. So ours is keep it fresh. So fresh stands for friendly, respect, respect, um, um, friendly, respect, ethical, superior service and having fun so you can be you know friendly and and you can be respectful so our franchisees have to be respectful when they call in if they're if we've done something wrong but we have to be respectful to to uh customers and we expect um you know we, we just expect respect is a value for us and um ethical doing things the right way um you know don't don't take a shortcut or else you're going to get cut um and and then superior service, right? And then, but the, the half fun thing do, is really important for us because it does, none of this stuff matters if you're not enjoying what you're doing. So, so we're passionate about what we're doing. And, and um, so th that's our value statement. And um, so I think I would encourage those of you out there listening to, to dive in what, it, what is your heart, what is your why, and then 
create a, create some values that your team can buy into and, and feel like it's theirs. I love that. Oh yeah. And I do notice that, that it's, um, we, what, what I always say about the values and the mission and all those things is making sure that, that, that it's lived out and that mm-hmm. people are held accountable for the behaviors that are counter to those things. And that they're also recognized when they live those out in real full ways too. Right. right. Um, Cause often they're just words on a board or on a letterhead or on a website. And do we have a way to track it? I remember doing a, <laughs> I had a very interesting exchange with two people at work and I had never written anybody up or really had to let anybody go or anything like that up to this point. And this is pretty far into my leadership journey. And I, I had been taught this, these two particular people at work did, did something that was really, really low, low and outside of our team values, outside of the organizational values. And while the organization did have the values like on the performance reviews, so like the values were actually on there, it, uh, that's good because at least now you can align their performance with right. them, whether they meet the values or not. But at the same time, it still lacked a little bit of oomph for being able to, to really hold people accountable to them. But I could say at least this is organizational values, you know, that's, it's on the performance review, you know, we hold, you know, you seriously and that, that I, that we value this. And so I'm going to have to take this, I'm going to have to write you up for these behaviors that were, that fell, fell way short of what our organizational and our team values were. And I'm doing, just know I would do the same for anyone else because we have to be consistent in how we hold people accountable. And I'm sure they were like, kind of, you know, like just reflecting for themselves in that moment and going, wow, like she takes it seriously, but at the same time, really, did I, did I break the value? Did I, are values really that important? And in that moment, I felt good that the answer in their mind should be, well, absolutely, at least to her. Right. Right. (laughs) Absolutely. No, that's, that's a good, you know, sometimes uh, I'm not saying we get our value, we get it all done right, but at least it's a, uh, it's a measurement to say, Hey, are we failing at one of these? Do we need to refocus on one of these that, you know, so I, th- I think that's you hit the nail on the head. That's awesome. Well, so for those who are listening, if you have found like, a lot of value listening to my conversation with Jonathan, if you're having some light bulbs go off like I am, you know, things are just like spinning in there. Um, but, you know, make sure that you go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening and far and share it far and wide. That's when more leaders hear this stuff, more people, leaders in development are hearing this stuff and it helps them grow. And also don't forget too to um, you know write that five-star review there on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, because the same thing, it's like an algorithm. So the more of those reviews happen, the more it moves it up, the more people can access it if they put in management leadership. Thanks to everybody listening for already making us, kind of putting us on the map globally. We're like a top 80 podcast on management around the world, but we want to continue to move up and up and up. So do that. Jonathan, this has been amazing. Uh, Really is you just are um, an inspiration to me and I'm sure other people who are aspiring and thinking at this point, starting a business and how to do it the right way where it's values-based and and other focused and flipping the script on who you serve and things like that. That's been really helpful. I appreciate you. I appreciate it, Heather. It's, um, I enjoy your podcast a lot. And so, yeah, please, everyone leave a review. Re- reviews are key. And if you liked it, leave a review um, because uh, people, you know, it's it's always great to uh, see podcasts like this that create knowledge, um, be successful. So thank you, Heather, for having me on. <clears throat> and thanks, everybody, for listening to the Leadership with Heart podcast. Be well. Be well.